let's talk about it. Social distancing. If you're watching this in the spring of 2020, you know what it feels like. The only place left to go is the grocery, and the only social interaction you really get is yelling into the void online. It doesn't feel good. In fact, it feels very bad. And it kind of begs the question, how long can you last? How long can you be in isolation? Well, first things first, we need to define isolation because, as it turns out, there's a lot of different types. From a medical perspective, differing levels of isolation are used as a precaution when dealing with differing conditions. But the isolation I'm curious about is the one I've never expected to bother me. Social isolation. It's described as the absence of social interactions, contacts, and relationships. And as an introvert, I was smug and I thought that's basically me. Social distancing won't change anything. And I was very wrong. Here's the thing, right? We live in a society. Socialization has been a vital component of our species longer than we have technically been our species. During the Stone Age, early hominins were believed to have developed complex forms of social transmission to communicate how to make better tools, tools for our survival. And this intersection of socialization and education has persisted past survival. Nowadays, socializing serves as this constant sounding board for our behavior. It's through interacting with others that we develop our own identity and perspective. And if we lose access to that, some very strange things happen. When you first enter isolation, you might feel fine, even for a couple of days. But as time goes on, you'll notice that everything becomes sharper as you grow hypersensitive to normal stimuli. Your heart will start racing and paranoia and anxiety might start settling in. You'll begin to struggle to keep focus. After a few weeks, the fantasies you've been escaping with turn violent. You'll start slipping between depressive episodes and bouts of aggression, doing anything to feel something. And then, after enough time has passed, you'll just vanish. Not physically, but researchers who watch prisoners in solitary confinement noticed a complete breakdown or disintegration of the identity of the isolated individual. This can be described as a simultaneous attack of several symptoms that effectively erase the personality of the isolated individual. And somehow, that's not even the scariest part. No, that happens after isolation. In 1970, a psychologist named Harry Harlow was widowed. He wasn't a kind man, but he was established in his field, controversial but renowned for a particular avenue of research. You see, he spent the majority of his life studying the behaviors of rhesus macaque monkeys. He began by exploring what motherhood really meant to these primates, breaking it down into its fundamental components of touch, motion, and play. But the cost of his experiments was cruelty, this really deep and unimaginable cruelty that he designed and pursued every single day. It won him recognition, but it warped him. As time went on, he sunk deeper and deeper into alcoholism and depression. Losing his wife appeared to be the final straw. He turned his research to isolation in an attempt to incite depression in his subjects. He designed an instrument he liked to call the Pit of Despair, and into it would go newborn monkeys. They lived completely isolated in individual chambers for up to a year. While none died in isolation, when they were eventually socialized for the first time in their life, they would go into a shock. Harlow said that long isolation obliterated the animals socially. Obliterated. Erased. That's the language we use to describe the effects of isolation on social creatures. All of us in isolation right now with varying degrees of access to communication and comfort, is that what we have to look forward to? Now, obviously, I can't test this out on actual human beings, right? That seems really difficult and unethical. I've watched The Good Place, so I did the next best thing. Sims. In case you didn't know, it's a sandbox game designed to simulate real life. You can generate these people, called Sims, and set them off to live their own autonomous lives. Our goal is to identify how isolation affects the average person, or sim. But we need to be more specific. How does it affect them? So let's try to focus on one of the primary indicators in the game. Mood. So we want to figure out how a sim's emotions change when they're in isolation. This means that we want to look at the difference between sims in isolation versus the ones who are free. Now, you might be inclined to just let a sim be free for a while and see how they behave, and then pop them into isolation later and track the changes. But the problem with that is that you don't know if any of the changes in behavior is due to isolation or because of some other reason we don't know. So maybe you think it would be better to compare two sims side by side, one in isolation and one free. But 
that also has a problem. Those sims might be inclined to experience different emotions in the first place. Maybe the sim in isolation is just predisposed to being sad, so you overestimate the effect of isolation. This bias is introduced by how we select our subjects, and it's a really big problem. Now to get around that, in real life, we would run a randomized controlled trial. So we get a really, really big group of people and randomly sort them into two groups, isolated and free. Because we do it randomly with a bunch of people, we shouldn't face the issue of one group being significantly more likely to be sad than the other. But luckily, this isn't real life. This is Sims. We can just duplicate them so we have two sims with the exact same name, age, and propensity to experience specific emotions. So in total, for each sim, I ran two trials, poor conditions and rich conditions. In each trial, one sim was in isolation, while its duplicate was free to do whatever they wanted. To keep track of all this, I, I obviously made a spreadsheet, and so my experiment, The Sims of Despair, began. So it's been four days and I now have 280 observations across 10 sims in four different treatment variations. Uh, this is my life, I guess. <laughs> We've got the wealthy and isolated, wealthy and free, poor and isolated, and poor and free. Okay, so each observation contains the number of times a sim experienced one of the emotions on a given day. This means that if they were sad and then fine and then sad again, we would have two sad and one fine. Now, obviously this doesn't represent how long a sim felt a certain emotion. For example, they could have just been sad all day and had like a blip of being fine or the other way around. But I have been staring at Sims for four days, so I don't care anymore. <laughs> I really came up with the concept of this video without realizing how boring it would be to execute. But anyway, each Sim in each treatment variation was tracked for seven days. It was originally supposed to be 10 weeks, but they kept dying. They keep burning to death. So despite my sketchy measurement system, we're just going to assume that these are accurate enough. First off, if we combine the subjects in each variation and calculate the percentage each mood appeared every day, we get these graphs. There are two really interesting things here. First off, notice how many more times positive or neutral emotions like happiness or inspiration appear among the wealthier sims, compared to poorer sims who appear to be sadder, more tense, and uncomfortable, regardless of whether they were isolated. Next, notice the differences between the isolated and the free. Among wealthy sims, we do see more instances of sadness, but overall, the two groups look pretty similar. The same cannot be said for the poor sims. Poor isolates were dominated with sadness after just two to three days, while their counterparts still experienced more emotional variety. But five emotions really stand out overall. Happy, fine, uncomfortable, sad, and tense. If we take a closer look at their development over time, we get an even better idea of the truth. Wealthy sims experienced being happy or fine more often than their poor counterparts, regardless of isolation. And while isolates in general were more likely to feel sad, the poor ones were hit especially hard. Now obviously we should take these findings with like a truckload of salt because they're from a video game and an incredibly small sample size. But at the same time, it's kind of common sense. <laughs> but there is one other thing I noticed in this little experiment, something that wasn't captured in the numbers, because by the time I noticed, uh, I was too deep in and I didn't want to restart. And it's why the isolated Sims were so sad. You see, they weren't upset about missing work or not going to school or not even pursuing their aspirations. No, the thing that really got them, that really broke them down into desolation, it was a lack of social contact. Just like Harry Harlow's monkeys, these sims couldn't bear to be alone and it broke them down and erased them so that all that was left behind was sadness and a need to pee. If you think about it, social distancing is a really weird name because a virus can't spread through friendship alone. Sure, right now, if you can, you should be physically distancing to protect those frontline workers who don't get that option. But that's all the more reason to keep socializing in other ways. You don't get the option of just seeing your coworkers or your friends in class. You need to be really intentional about socializing right now. And it's an effort that we're not used to making, but it's really worth doing. 
call your friends, call your family, have a game night or a movie night or start a book club. Just do something. Do anything to keep yourself tethered to the social world. Because if there's one thing staring at Sims for four days straight has taught me, it's that you shouldn't really cheap out on an oven because it'll catch fire and kill you. And right now, we need each other more than ever. I hope you liked that video. Uh, if you did, you know, like and subscribe. I don't know what to say. It's a really weird time right now. I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're feeling safe. I hope that you're self-isolating if you can. And if you can't, thank you for everything that you're doing. Uh, but either way, have a lovely day. <laughs> it's so weird right now.